Welcome to lecture 29 of our course on high performance computing. We are currently looking at the operation of cache memories, trying to understand how they affect the performance of our programs. The, towards the end of the previous lecture, I had uh, given you a rough idea of one of the determinants of computer development and I had shown this to you in the form of a graph which is often described as a Moore's law graph. What this graph actually plotted was over a period of time where uh, on the x axis there was a linear progression of time with years, how the, how the performance of computer systems or the components of computer systems was improving due to technology developments. And uh, the important thing about the Moore's law graph was that it was showing you on a log scale on the, on the y axis, linear scale on the x axis, that the speed with which processor circuits were becoming faster was much more than the speed at which memory circuits were becoming faster. In other words, the speed disparity between processors and memories was growing faster and faster under the Moore's law prediction. And uh, the consequence of this was that cache memory hierarchies may have ended up becoming a little complicated. But before actually coming to that, I did want to comment, if you look at the Moore's law graph, uh, which was one of the slides in the previous lecture, then you would have noticed that uh, the graph was plotted for a period of time from about uh, 1980 until about 2000 in the graph that I used. Originally, uh, Gordon Moore had plotted the graph for data from the much earlier points in time, 70s and into the 80s. And subsequently, people had found that this trend had continued. Occasionally, the slope of the, of the performance improvement line may have been more or less, depending on how uh, technology trends had moved. But uh, one additional fact which should be borne in mind to understand why the consequences of the Moore's law graph may not be that uh, uh, much today should be by bearing in mind that uh, when the performance of a computer system goes up, it's possible that the amount of power or the amount of energy that is consumed for the execution of a program may also have to go up. By power, you might view the amount of heat that is generated when uh, when, when a program runs on the computer. And it turns out that the power and the heat are alternative labels for the y-axis in the Moore's law graph. In other words, as one looks at a long time at the amount of heat generated by a processor, one found, finds a similar exponential or a similar behavior to what was plotted for performance. As a consequence, it soon became, over, as time went on, it became very clear that one, uh, computer architects could not continue designing processors, which became more and more complicated and more and more powerful, because at the same time, the amount of heat, the amount of power would be growing uh, at a very fast rate, and it would be, become very difficult to cool down and even to provide the energy for these computers to keep on executing, which is why the technology trends did not proceed in, in this direction for very long. And some trade-offs had to be made between improvements in performance and reduction in power and so on, so on. But in any event, the bottom line from our quick understanding of the Moore's law graph is that if we had thought of a memory hierarchy in which there was cache, main memory, and secondary memory, then with time, as the speed disparity between processors and main memories became worse, there may, become, may have been the need for improving the nature of the caches to have small, fast caches in addition to larger, slower caches, just to close the speed gap between the CPU and the main memory. Remember that the CPU operates at speeds which are comparable to those of the very highest part of the memory hierarchy, such as the registers. Okay, now with those uh, additional comments to my quick uh, discussion about the Moore's law from the previous class, let's move on to uh, an important uh, topic in connection with cache memory, and that is how does our knowledge of cache memory change the, our perspective on the programs that we write? And I've titled the, this set of slides, Caches and Programming, since we are going to look, we understand enough about the cache memories now and the way that they operate to be able to view the performance of our programs if running on particular kinds of cache hardware. Now, in order to do this, our objective in doing this rather is to for the programs that, are, that we write or parts of programs that are important to us to learn techniques using which we can assess the cache related performance issues. In other words, get, get some kind of an understanding of how a particular part of a program of ours would execute or would benefit from a particular kind of a cache. That's our, our objective. So to put our knowledge of cache together with our understanding of programs to get some benefit from the programming side. 
the way I'm going to do this is by basically by looking at a number of examples of simple programs. Now to keep the discussion uh, somewhat simple but yet, but yet realistic, I will, we will not take into account uh, the behavior of the instructions of our programs. So when I talk about a program or an important part of a program, we will concentrate primarily on the interaction between the program and memory as far as its data axes are concerned. We could for assume, for example, that we are running the program on a computer system which has separate instruction and data caches and that we will assume that the instruction cache behavior is not of interest to us right now. We are concentrating only on the data cache. That is essentially what we will start our, our doing most of the examples that we will look at. So we will consider only the data cache in our examples. And a typical kind of a data cache configuration I will use in these examples may be something like this. I will use some variations on this kind of a configuration, but I just wanted to remind you about what we have learned about the four cues of cache organization. So in this particular quick description of a cache, I mentioned that the size of the cache is 16 kilobytes. I mentioned that the size of each block in the cache is 32 bytes. I also mentioned that the cache is direct mapped from which you understand that direct mapped block placement is used which means that for any main memory block there is a unique cache block into which that main memory block might be copied. In addition, I am informing you that the cache uses the write back policy which means that on a write hit, on a write access to the cache which is a hit in the cache, the main memory is not updated at that point in time. The, the update is done only for the cache copy and subsequently if that particular cache block is replaced, the main memory copy would be updated. So these were some of the key words from our understanding of cache organization in the framework of the four cues of cache organization. And I will give you similar brief descriptions of the cache in order to assess the behavior of a particular program. Okay, now um, for this particular cache organization, remember that uh, we were able to use the information in this description to understand how an address generated by the processor would be viewed by the cache hardware. And just to quickly remind you, we had to decide how many bits were going to be used for the block offset, how many bits were going to be used for the cache index, and we knew that the remaining bits would be used for the tag. For this particular example, given that the size of a block is 32 bytes, we immediately know that the offset is going to require 5 bits because log base 2, 32 is equal to 5. From the fact that it is direct mapped with a 16 kilobyte cache, we were able to calculate that 16 kilobytes is the size of the cache and the size of each cache block is 32 bytes from which we know that the number of cache blocks is 512, 16k divided by 32 and log base 2 of 512 is the 9 bits that are needed for index. So we were able to calculate the number of bits for index, the number of bits for offset and assume that the remaining bits are used for the tag. And therefore, this is the form in which this information was used in our analysis of, uh, or in our description about how the cache organization went about. Okay, now we're going to start with a very simple example of a code fragment. Now, the particular ex example I'll start with, I describe as vector sum reduction. And uh, from the from the description, you'll be able to understand that this seems to be an operation or a, a program which is doing something on a vector of data and it seems to be doing a sum reduction on the vector of data. The word reduction suggests that there is some reduction or lessening in the amount of data and the, the word sum suggests that the way that the reduction is done is by adding the values of all the elements within the vector and that is exactly what this simple program is going to be doing. So it as shown by this uh, C implementation. So in this example, I have a vector which is implemented as a floating point array A. The size of the vector is 2048 which means that the array elements will be referred to as A of 0 up to A of 2047. And in addition, I have uh, indicated that each of the array elements is of, si is of type double. Remember that double, a double float is a float which is not 32 bits in size but which is 64 bits in size which means that the size of each array element is 8 bytes. Now in this particular code segment, I, what is what, being done is for 
for i equal to 0, i less than 2048 i plus plus, the elements of the array of the vector a are being added to a running sum which has been initialized to 0. So that at the end of the execution of this for loop, the variable sum will contain the, the sum of all the vector elements, which is why it is called a sum reduction. At the end of this small piece of code, the variable sum contains the sum of all the vector elements a of 0 through a of 2047. So that is a nice simple code example. It is of course not a complete program, but if you can understand this particular program from the perspective of our cache behavior and if this is a very important part of a program of ours, then we probably have a good understanding of the overall behavior of the program itself, a larger program. Okay, now recall that I, I indicated that we are not going to be, we're not going to concern ourselves with the instructions corresponding to this program. We are going to concentrate only on the data axes generated by this program. But in order to do the analysis, it will probably be easier for us if we can view the program not in this C form, but in a machine form, in a machine code form, so that we can actually see the individual loads and stores. In other words, we can identify what the different memory accesses are. Remember, we are going to have to view this program in terms of the loads and stores that it sends to the cache memory and exactly what address is associated with each of the loads and the stores. Only then will we be able to talk about how the cache memory will perform for a particular uh, program. So we need to move down from understanding vector sum reduction in C to understanding the vector sum reduction in terms of the load and store instructions. How, in, how many load and store instructions are executed and what are the addresses associated with the operands of the load and store instructions. Okay, now, um, if you remember from our d discussion of simple code examples for loops that were somewhat similar, um, we had a loop index and in the examples that I used, the loop index was typically implemented inside a register and therefore the loop index i may be not a variable that we have to worry about as far as the cache behavior is concerned. So if we were to assume that the compiler generates machine language code for this particular loop in such a way that the loop index i is handled inside a register rather than being accessed out of memory each time the variable i is referred to, the variable i is referred to several times in each loop iteration. So if I make the assumption that the loop index i is accessed out of a register, then I can ignore the loop variable, the loop index i completely in my analysis of this program. Um, in addition, I could assume that the sum variable also is handled outside uh, uh, through a register and it should be fairly easy to see that a compiler could quite easily do that or if the compiler did not do it, I could modify the program so that it did that in order to reduce the number of memory accesses that this program makes. So uh, with these two assumptions, our perspective on vector sum reduction will actually get simplified substantially we would no longer worry about the accesses to sum or to i in this program and what we are left with is just the references to the array a, to the vector a. And in short, that is how we will view this particular program. We will view this program not in terms of its instructions because we have already decided that we will be worried only about the data cache behavior of the program. Further, we will completely ignore the loop indices, we will completely ignore many of these variables. In this case, there is only one variable sum and we will be primarily worried about the accesses to the vector A. Now if we are primarily worried about the accesses to the vector A, then viewing this program in terms of the machine instructions is very simple. I do not even have to worry, think about how this program gets compiled. I very clearly understand that the first time through the for loop, there will be a need to load from A of 0 into a register because subsequently the value of the contents of that register will be added to the variable sum which is also in a register. Therefore each time through this loop, the loop corresponding to vector sum reduction, there will be a load instruction which loads an element of the vector into a register. So in short, in thinking of the vector sum reduction, I can think about the vector sum reduction as being a series of load instructions. The first time through the loop, it is a load of a of 0, second time through the loop it is a load of A of 1 and so on. So I view the vector sum reduction as being a sequence of 2048 loads, load of 0 through load of 2047. Remember that these were the, the, the size of my vector was 2048. 
2048. Hence the sequence from load of A of 0 to load of 2000 A of 2047. Okay, now, in order to proceed to trying to think about what the impact of this program, and remember this is now the program that I am worrying about. This is what I have distilled out of the vector sum reduction loop. This is the essence that we are going to concentrate on. In order to proceed to understand the impact on the cache, I have to be able to calculate the address of each of these vector elements. It is not enough to talk about A of 0, I have to talk about a specific address. Therefore, I make an assumption about what the address of A of 0 is. So, I will assume that A of 0 has some address. In this particular example, I am assuming that the address of A of 0 is hexadecimal A000. Let me remind you that if whenever you see a number which has 0x in front of it, it is a hexadecimal number. We have not used hexadecimal for some time now. But uh, so, this is telling me that the, the address which is of concern to us is being given to us in hex, which means that uh, base 16 and A is 1010. 0, 1, 0 these are the three zeros. If I wanted to view this as a 32-bit address, then I would put additional zeros to, to make it into the required 32-bit address. Okay, now, if I am assuming that the address of A of 0 is hex A000, what can I assume about the address of A of 1? What I will assume is that the way that the compiler lays out the array inside the virtual address space, and remember it is the compiler that decides the order in which different elements are uh, placed in the virtual address space corresponding to the process that will be uh, come into existence when this program executes, the compiler makes a decision. I will assume that the compiler, if it assumes that the address of A of 0 is hex A000, will put A of 1 into the next memory location and it will put A of 2 into the memory location following that and so on. In other words, it will put the elements of the vector into contiguous neighboring memory locations. That seems like a reasonable assumption. Okay, now, then I can now view each of these memory addresses from the perspective of how the cache will look at that particular memory address. And uh, let me just go back to our understanding of the cache. In this particular example, we are going to assume that the cache is direct mapped, 16 kilobyte right through with 32 byte block size, which means that in looking at the address, we have to view the address in this way. The five least significant bits of the address are offset. This is followed by nine bits of index and then 18 bits of tag if we are talking about a 32-bit address. Now when I think about the address hex A000, I can view it in this light. I can look at the least significant five bits, I can look at the next nine bits and so on. What happens when I do that? The least significant five bits, remember the, le the least significant five bits for the offset, the next nine bits were the index and the remaining 18 bits were the tag. So if I remove the least significant 5 bits as being the offset and then I count the next 9 bits 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6, 7, 8, 9, what I come up with is this value, the bit value 1 followed by 8 zeros. And that instead of referring to it as binary 1 followed by 8 zeros, I refer to it as decimal 256. You can evaluate this as uh, uh, 2 power 1, 2 power 2, etc. This is actually decimal 2 power 56. So, in short, for the particular cache organization that we are using, a 32 kilobyte, I'm sorry, a 16 kilobyte cache with 32 byte uh, block size under direct mapping, the array element A of 0 will have its index bits equal to 1000000, zero, 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 which is decimal 256. What about uh, array? element A of 1. Now, in order to find out the address of array element A of 1, I have to know how much space A of 0 occupies, but we know that the vector sum reduction loop is dealing with double float values from which we understand that the size of each array element is 8 bytes. Right? So, the size of an array element under double is 8 bytes, which tells me that in any particular cache block, given that the block size is 32 bytes, four consecutive array elements will be present. So, in any one of the cache blocks, let's suppose this is one of the cache blocks of size 32 bytes, you actually have enough space to store four 8 byte doubles. Therefore, if I have A, A of 0, I could also have A of 1, A of 2 and A of 3 
all within the same cache block. That is what this simple uh, observation allows me to, uh, to learn. In other words, if A of 0 has address A000 and A of 1 has address A008, which is 8 bytes after the address of A of 0 and so on, and I do the same calculation using its these de significant bits, I will find out that A of 0, A of 1, A of 2 and A of 3 are all going to be in the same cache block and I will all have that index 256. In other words, once A of 0 is in the cache, I will know for sure that A of 1, A of 2 and A of 3 are also in the cache because they all occupy, they all come from the same cache block. They just differ in their index bits. If you look at the addresses of A of 0 through A of 3. In fact, that is what I have over here. Here I am showing you the addresses of A of 0, A of 1, A of 2 and A of 3. Notice that A of 0 is 1 followed by all zeros. We are looking only at the index bits and, and bits following. A of 1 is going to be 8 bits, 8 bytes later which means that it will have the address A008. A of 2 is going to have 8 bytes after that which is going to be 10000 at the last bits and so on. And you will notice that they all have the same index bits. Okay. So, with this uh, observation, we can project f look, look forward to the array elements A of 4 through A of 7 and play the same, uh, do the same calculation and we would find out that given the base address of A of 0, we could calculate the base address of A of 4 and find out that the base address of A of 4 is such that it will have an index of 257 within the cache that we were talking about. And A of 4 through A of 7 would all have that same property. In other words, the next four array elements, the first four array elements all have index of 256, cache index of 256. The, the, array of the next four array elements after that all have cache index of 257 and so on. And this is entirely because the four array elements A of 0 through A of 3 all occupy one cache block given that the size of a cache block is 32 bytes. Similarly, array elements A of 4 through A of 7 all occupy one cache block. And this could proceed. This, this reasoning could, could be used to argue all your way through the complete program. In other words, from loading of A of 0 all the way through loading of A of 2047. But to do this systematically, we will actually come draw a table in which we will try to calculate the number of cache misses and the number of cache hits that would result for that vector sum reduction program. So, I am going to draw a table of this kind. So, what have I drawn in this table? In this table, in the leftmost column, what I am showing you is the program itself. The program first loads A of 0, then it loads A of 1. Right? This is a program which, th the only interesting instructions in this program to us right now are the load instructions. And the program first loads A of 0, then it loads A of 1, then it loads A of 2 and it keeps on going until it loads A of 2047. Now, we know that the base address of the array, which is the address of A of 0, we assumed was hex A000. And given that the size of each array element is 8 bytes, we calculated the base, the address of A of 1, the address of A of 2 and so on. So, we were able to calculate the addresses of each of the array elements using the base address assumption and our knowledge about the size of each array element. The size of each array element is, is decided by the type declaration used in the program. In our particular program, each array element is of type double, which means it occupies 8 bytes which is why there is an 8 byte difference between each of these addresses. And then doing, knowing what the cache hardware does with an address for the particular cache that we are concerned about, I can understand what the index bits for each of these addresses is. And as we had said, the first four array elements have index of 256, the next four array elements have index of 257 and we can keep on doing this. And in doing so, we will find out that the last four array elements have index bits of 255. Okay, now, the next question is how well is the program going to do on hardware which has a cache of the kind that we had described? In other words, how many of these accesses are going to be hits and how many of these accesses are going to be misses within the cache? Okay, now, the, the way to think about this is we could start by assuming that when the program starts executing, none of the array elements will be present inside the cache. And therefore, the, when the program executes its first load instruction, load A of 0, it is going to encounter a miss. 
nothing would have come into the cache since nothing had been requested by the program before as far as the address space of this process is concerned. And therefore, we would guess that the first access is going to be a miss. However, as a result of that miss on A of 0, there's going to be a fetching of a block from the main memory into the cache. And that block is a 32-byte block, which contains not only A of 0, but also A of 1, A of 2, and A of 3. Hence, when the second load instruction is executed to load A of 1, we guess that the load instruction of A of 1 is going to, is going to benefit a cache hit, as will the load of A of 2, as will the load of A of 3. And we can continue this kind of uh, thinking for all the addresses in this table. And what we'll end up with is something like this. We see, uh, let me just uh, get rid of this unnecessary notation here. So what we see is something like this. So once again, this is the same table we had before. <coughs> we had, uh, let me just go back and make sure. Yeah, it is exactly the same table that we had before. So this is the column with the array elements. This is the column with their addresses based on the assumption that A of 0 is at address A000. These were the index, uh, cache indices which we calculated from that. And this was the reasoning that we came up with. The first, the access to array element A of 0 would be a miss because the program initially when it started executing would not have had anything fetched into the cache by the hardware. But once A of 0 was a miss, the cache block which contains A of 0 will also contain A of 1, A of 2, and A of 3. And hence, hence the accesses to lo load A of 1, to load A of 2, and to load A of 3 would all be hits. After this, when the time comes to fetch A of 4, once again, it's a different cache index. The cache hardware would find out that there is a miss, but the subsequent four accesses to A of 5, A of 6, and A of 7 would be hits, and so on. Okay, now, in, in terms of terminology, um, people often talk about that first miss, which happens because your program has not prior, pr previously accessed that particular cache block. It's often referred to as a cold start miss. Since when your program starts executing, we assume that the cache is initially empty and it's compulsory. There's no way to avoid this miss and it's starting because the cache started off empty. So this particular kind of a miss might be de described as a cold start miss. It's coming because the program initially started executing in a situation where the cache did not contain any of its data. Subsequently, we have the hits. Now, we can go ahead and calculate the hit ratio for this particular program, for the particular cache that we are talking about. And we find out that the hit ratio is in fact 75%. How do we come up with this? We know that there are a total of 2048 accesses of which every fourth access is a miss and the remaining three-fourths of the accesses are hits, which tells us that there will be a hit ratio of 75%. So 75% of all the memory references which this program, 75% uh, of the accesses which this program makes to memory will actually be satisfied directly by the cache which we had talked about. And more specifically, out of the 2048 memory accesses that this program makes, 1536 will be hits. And if we think about it a little bit, all of these 1536 hits are happening because of spatial locality of reference. Why do I say it's happening because of spatial locality of reference? It's happening because, just think about the, the three hits that we had over here. Why was the reference to A of 1 a hit? It was a hit because, because of the fact that the cache hardware is designed in terms of blocks, in which any one of the blocks contains four neighboring elements of the, of the vector A, spatial locality is automatically being exploited. I get a miss on A of 0 and I have to, the hardware has to get the block from memory into the cache, but the benefit that one gets is the neighbors of A, of A of 0, are immediately present out of the cache. And that was what we talked of as spatial locality of reference. And this particular program is showing very good spatial locality of reference in that after A of 0 was referenced, its three neighbors, A of 1, A of 2, and A of 3, were in fact referenced in the immediate future. And if we had had a larger block size, we would have got more and more benefit out of the spatial locality of reference. 
This particular cache has a block size of only 32 bytes, which is why we got the spatial locality of reference benefit for only the next three elements. Okay, now other observations which we could make. Um, this is an interesting observation. Let me just read it out to you. Let us imagine that we had written our program in the following ways. If the loop that we had just seen was preceded by a loop that accessed all the array elements, then the hit ratio of our loop would be 100 percent. Let us just think about this a little bit. So, the, the idea that I am working with here is, so we had this vector sum reduction and if we are now considering this loop and this loop we are now understand for the cache that we are concerned about, the cache that we are concerned about, we know that for this particular loop the, the hit ratio was 75 percent because A of 0 suffered a miss, but A of 1, 2 and 3 suffered hits giving me a 75 percent hit ratio. Now the current suggestion is that knowing this, I could actually have included another loop over here in which all that I do is for each of the array elements, I just access A of i. So, this could be uh, something like uh, S equals A of i, just an access to A of i. Now, what is the, the purpose for doing this? Uh, pre, I, what I am doing is I am preceding the loop, this is the loop that I am interested in. I am preceding the loop that I am interested in by another loop and all that this loop is doing is it is accessing each of the array elements. What is the purpose of that loop? The purpose of that loop is actually to cause the contents of the entire array to be present in the cache. So, when the end, when the, the loop that I have just written executes, it is going to cause A of 0 and A of 1 and A of 2 and A of 3 to come into the cache. As a consequence, when the loop that I am interested in starts executing, the entire vector A will be present in the cache and therefore, rather than executing at a hit ratio of 75 percent, the loop that I am interested in will execute at a hit ratio of 100 percent. It will get 100 percent cache hits. Every single access to the array during this loop will be a hit. What is the price that I am paying? The price that I am paying is I am executing additional instructions. I am executing an additional 2048 load instructions. And of those 2048 load instructions, how many of them will be hits and how many of them will be misses? If I actually do 2048, then I will get 75 percent hit ratio on that loop. But the overall hit ratio of the entire program will be more than what I had originally, in other words more than 75 percent. And that is therefore an interesting idea. Let me just uh, put down what we have over here. The, the, the observation is that if I had preceded the loop that I am concerned about by a loop which essentially just accessed all the array elements, thereby causing them to be present in the cache when my vector sum reduction loop executed, then my vector sum reduction loop would execute with 100 percent hit ratio. And in this particular case, I could not say that uh, all of the hits are because of spatial locality of reference. I would be able to say that 25 percent of the hits are due to temporal locality of reference. Why temporal locality of reference? Because the previous loop which I had executed had accessed A of 0. Therefore, a little later on in time when my vector sum reduction loop execute, executed and accessed A of 0, because of temporal locality of reference, it found A of 0 within the cache and therefore it suffered, a, it, it benefited from a hit. Therefore, the 100 percent hit ratio that my vector sum reduction loop uh, benefits from will be 25 percent due to temporal locality and only 75 percent due to spatial locality. Of course, the overall behavior of the program is not uh, improved because I have caused more instructions to be executed and therefore the program will take more time. In fact, the program will, will suffer as many misses, in other words as many main memory accesses as it did without the preceding loop. Therefore, this is just for the purpose of understanding that it is possible to exploit both temporal and spatial locality of reference and that your program could be doing one or the other. And the, but what is actually important is to understand how your program is behaving. Okay, now let us understand a little bit more about what is happening by looking at a small variant of example 1. Now you will recall that in example 1 we did vector sum reduction on a vector, a double vector of size 2048. Now I am going to modify that, I am going to consider vector sum reduction with the uh, vector of size 4096. 
Okay, so this is a vector which is double the size of the previous vector. Now what will happen for this particular, uh, for, the, for the same cache that we had talked about in the previous example, what will happen for this particular uh, cache? And first of all, why should it make a difference? Now the reason that we should uh, understand that it makes a difference is that think about the previous example that we had where the size of the vector was 2048. What was the actual size of the vector? The vector contained 2048 elements and the size of each element was 8 bytes which means that the total size of the vector A was 2048 multiplied by 8 and if you do this calculation you will see that it is of size, I am sorry, it is of size 16 kilobytes. What is important about 16 kilobytes? 16 kilobytes is the size of the cache that we are currently dealing with. In other words, when I had vector sum reduction on an array of size 2000 or on an array of 2048 elements, the entire array could fit into the cache. On the other hand, if I deal with vector sum reduction on an array of size 4096 double position floats, then the size of the vector is now going to be twice the size of the cache. In other words, this vector will not fit into the cache completely. The vector is larger than the cache. Therefore, if I had considered preceding my vector sum reduction loop by a loop which just accessed each of the array elements and the array was of size 4096, then since the entire array no longer fits into the cache, there is no benefit that I will get in the case of the 4096 example and I will still suffer the misses. In other words, just preceding the, the loop of interest to me, the vector sum reduction loop by a loop which accesses each of the 4096 elements will not help at all. It will just make the program slower. I will still get only 75 percent hit ratio and this is entirely because the, the, this vector itself does not fit into the cache. Right? So after execution of the preceding loop, the second half of the array will be in the cache and our loop sees misses as we just saw. So there will be no benefit from preceding the loop by a loop which accesses each array, ch array element as we saw in the case of the smaller vector. We, in the case of the smaller vector, by having that small loop before the vector sum reduction loop, I could artificially give the vector sum reduction loop a hit ratio of 100 percent. But that is not going to happen if I have a larger vector, in which case I will get only the hit ratio of 75 percent even for the vector sum reduction loop. Now the kinds of misses that cannot be avoided in this case are what are called capacity misses. We could not avoid the capacity misses for the larger vector because of the capacity problem. The vector is bigger than the capacity of the cache and there is no avoiding those misses. Whereas for the smaller vector, since the vector was smaller than the size of the cache, I could avoid some of the capacity misses because the, the, the cache was capacious enough or large enough to accommodate the entire vector and I could therefore preload in some sense the vector into the cache by using a preceding loop which accessed each of the array elements, vector elements. Okay. So we can now move to another example. <coughs> I am going to move to an example which is a little bit different from the previous the example that we just saw, but we are going to proceed along very similar lines. Once again we are going to look at a C version of an operation, we are going to understand what the operation is. We will ignore all the instructions, we will ignore all the variables that we can like loop indices and so on and concentrate on the critical elements, the critical data elements accessed by the piece of code. Okay, now the second example we are going to look at is something called vector dot product. So this is something many of you would have heard of. It is the multiplication of two vectors resulting in a value, so the uh, a scalar value. So in this particular example then I need to have in the C code, I have a dot product of a vector A of size 2048 with a vector B also of size 2048 and the dot product is going to end up in a variable called sum. So what the dot product does is it multiplies A of 0 by B of 0 multiplies A of 1 by B of 1, multiplies A of 2 by B of 2 and so on and adds all of these products together into the running sum constituted by the variable sum. We are going to use the same size of cache, the same cache organization that we had used in the vector sum reduction example. <coughs> so once again we have to reduce this C program into a version that we can understand the cache from. In other words we have to reduce it into a sequence of loads and stores and then we have to make some assumption about the address of the different 
the base address of A, the base address of B and then we can actually calculate the heat ratio for this particular program. So instead of actually uh, running through all the reasoning from the previous example once again, we can immediately sh shortcut to a description of what the references that will result from this program are. Once again, we will ignore any reference to the variable i because the variable i can be stored in a register and therefore need not show itself to the cache memory, need not result in a load or store instruction. So any reference to i can be ignored, right? Then i need not be loaded. Similarly, I will assume that the sum is maintained inside a register and therefore all that we are left with is loading a of 0, loading b of 0, then second iteration, loading a of 1, loading b of 1 and so on. So therefore we reduce the vector dot product program to the following reference sequence. The, so these are the memory references that the program would make under the assumptions that we have had to make. Initially the first reference is to load a of 0, then there is an instruction to load b of 0, then the next iteration of the loop, load a of 1, load b of 1 and so on. Therefore it will end with load, b, load a of 2047, load b of 2047. Okay, now just as in the case of my vector sum reduction, I need to make some assumption about the base, the addresses of the vectors A and B and therefore I will just assume that the, the starting address of the vector A is A000 in hex and I will assume that the starting address of vector B is E000 once again in hex. Once you will observe that we are still dealing with double precision array elements and therefore just as in the case of our vector sum reduction each cache block will be la is large enough to hold four consecutive array elements. In other words, A of 0, A of 1, A of 2 and A of 3 will all be stored in one array element, one, one cache block. Similarly for B, B of 0, B of 1, B of 2, B of 3 will all fit into one cache block. Subsequently B of 4, B of 5, B of 6, B of 7 will be in the another cache block. Okay, so we could run through the same mechanisms that we used <coughs> in the vector sum reduction and we would end up with a table that looks something like this. Let me just run through each of the columns and rows of this table so we understand what is happening. So in the first column we have the program itself. Remember the program loads A of 0, then it loads B of 0, then it loads A of 1, then it loads B of 1 and so on. It ends with loading, um, I am sorry this should go up to 2040 odd. So it ends up loading until the last array element. So there is a mistake over here. Okay, now in the next column we have the addresses corresponding to, I will just bring your attention to the fact that the arrays of our size 2048, in this particular table I have gone only up to B of 1023, we should have gone up to B of 2047 and the address will be different. Okay, but uh, regardless of that. So the, address, the base address of A of 0 we are assuming is A000, the base address of B of 0 is E000. We know that A of 1 is going to have an address which is 8 bytes after the address of A of 0, similarly B of 1 and so on. So we can understand column, the second column based on our understanding of the second column of vector sum reduction. Once again using the same uh, principle as far as the interpretation of the bits is concerned. We, we, we calculate that the, ba the, the index, this is the index, cache index associated with A of 0 is 256. If you do the same calculation for B of 0, you will notice that the index is exactly the same. And as we had seen, A of 1, A of 2 and A of 3 are going to have the same index as B of 0, uh, I am sorry, as A of 0 since they come from the same cache block. So th this is the situation that we will end up with in terms of uh, the assumption that the base address of A of 0 is A000 and the base address of B of 0 is E000. Right. So uh, what we have now is a situation where if we assume that the program starts in the cold state then as before we are argue that the access to load A of 0 is going to be a miss because it is a cold start. What about the next reference which is to B of 0? Now, B of 0 is going to be a miss because we know that A of 0 and B of 0 have the same cache index which means that in this direct mapped cache only one of them can be in cache at a time. 
since my first reference would have brought A of 0 and its block into the cache, we can be sure that the second reference to B of 0 will be a miss. And we could think of this as a cold start miss in the sense that we have not referenced B of 0 before and therefore even if the program had been, uh, on the other hand if the program had been running a little bit, had running instructions prior to this, B of 0 could have been in the cache but this is happening because the cache starts off empty. Now when we go move on to A of 1, um, uh, let me just back off a little bit, the, the reference to B of 0 is a miss and we are arguing that we could describe it as a cold start miss. But as a consequence of B of 0 being a miss, the block containing B of 0 is going to be fetched from main memory into the cache. Therefore, the block containing A of 0 would have been removed from the cache and the block containing B of 0 occupies that particular direct mapped cache block. Therefore, when the reference, the next reference to A of 1 happens, it will find out that it is a miss because the block containing B of 0 is currently in that particular cache block which should have been occupied by the block containing A of 1 and we refer to this as a conflict miss. A conflict miss is a situation where because of the accesses made by my program, a miss has resulted. If my program had not referenced B of 0 between the reference to A of 0 and A of 1, then this would not have been a miss. It would in fact have been a hit because of spatial locality of reference as we saw in the case of the uh, vector sum reduction loop. Therefore, this is the, the miss that we encounter as a result of A of 1 is a different kind of a miss from the cold start situation. It is a miss which is because of the way that the program has been written and it is therefore called a conflict miss. It is a miss due to conflicts in the cache block requirements from the memory accesses of my, of my program, of the same program. As we run through the sequence of events, unfortunately, we find out that all of the references made by this program will be misses. There is not a single access made by this program in, in the sequence in, among the references that we are concerned about, the references to the array A and the array B, vector A and the vector B, that is going to be a hit with this particular cache. In short, we are going to see a hit ratio of 0 percent. This program is going to suffer from a hit ratio of 0 percent, every single access to array A or array B is going to have to be satisfied out of memory. It will involve fetching the block from memory into the cache and reading the, 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 the array element out of the cache. But that is going to happen for every single access made by this program. The program suffers a hit ratio of 0 percent or a miss ratio of 100 percent. What is the source of the problem over here? The source of the problem here is exactly the same problem that we had identified with direct map caches in general. This is a situation where I am accessing A of 0 and then B of 0 and A of B of 0 conflicts with A of 0. It actually wants to occupy the same cache block because A of 0 and B of 0 have the same index. The two different entities which have the same cache index, both wanting to occupy the same cache block under the direct mapping scheme. So the problem that we had identified with direct mapping is hitting us here. We have a situation where the elements of the array A and the array B, even though they are accessed in order, are being accessed with the same cache index. They are conflicting with each other and therefore our direct map cache is suffering from its the worst possible situation. Now one simple observation which we could make here is that the hit ratio could have been made better or the hit ratio would have been better if the base address of B had been selected such that it differs enough from the base address of A so that they have different index bits. You will note that we had made the assumption that the base address of A was A000 and that the base address of B was E000 and that is where we came up with this conflict from. The fact that uh, both A of 0 and B of 0 had an index, a cache index of 256. Both of these happened because of the assumptions about the base addresses. Remember the base address decides the index, the cache index because it is bits from the base address which will be used by the cache hardware to decide where to look into the cache under the direct mapped scheme of things. Therefore, this is the sort of basis for trying to improve the quality of our program. If we can somehow come up with a mechanism by which we can cause the base address of B, in other words the address of B of 0 to be different enough from the base address of A so that they do not have the same index bits, then we can improve the hit ratio for this program. So the question becomes how can we do that? 
I am going to describe one idea which I will refer to as packing by which a programmer can get some kind of control over the base address of something like uh, b of 0. Okay, now, the base assumption, the assumption that we are going to make in, uh, in coming up with this scheme is we are going to assume we know that it is the compiler that assigns virtual addresses to the different variables in our program like the vector a, the vector b and so on. I am going to assume that the compiler assigns addresses, virtual addresses to the different variables as and when it encounters the declaration of that variable. Therefore, it, ass it assigns the address hex a000 when it comes across double a2048. Next, it encounters double b2048 and therefore, it assigns the address hex e00. Okay, now, if I work with this information and I want to cause the base address of b to be different, then I could actually just cause the base address of b to be shifted, maybe by doing something artificial like this. What have I done? What I have actually done is I have instead of declaring a to be of size 2048, I have declared a to be of size 2052, b once again is of size 2048. What is the impact of declaring a to be of size 2052? The impact is going to be that if the compiler was going to assign the base address of a as hex a000 and under the old scheme of things it was going to assign the base address of b to be e000 with this new declaration of a I have made the, the, the size of the vector a bigger by one cache block and therefore if the compiler just goes ahead and uses the next address for the base address of b then by default the base address of b would be hex a00 I'm sorry not not a008 but uh, it it'll, it will be such that the index will be one more than the index would have been with e000 in other words if the index associated with hex a00 is 256 then by shifting the base address of b by one cache block by artificially making a one cache block bigger in other words four array elements bigger I will be shifting the index address of b to 257 rather than the 256 that it was before. Therefore, by artificially increasing the size of a I have apparently caused the compiler to give an index for b which is not going to conflict with the index of a. The base address of b will now be yeah, this is the number hex e020 in other words it is going to have an index of 257 if you do the calculation of the index take the hex address e020 and break it up into offset index and, and uh, tag you will find out that instead of having the value 256 it has the value 257 in its intermediate bits the bits uh, from the uh, not least significant 5 bits but the next 9 bits. So that was the that is apparently going to be the impact of changing the declaration of a in this small way. Now I am not saying that the, ve the vector a is being made into a larger vector all that we are trying to do here is to artificially cause the compiler to give us a more favorable address for the vector b and I could have achieved the same effect using a slightly different mechanism for example I could have kept the size of the vector a at 2048 but between the declaration for a and b I could have included let us say four other double variables x, y, z and w all double variables the effect would have been that each of them would have been assigned an address which was after the address of a so x would have had an address of e000 y would have had an address of e008 and so on and the net effect would have been that b would have benefited the same way to have an index value different from that of a right so the net effect now is going to be that if i run the same program but just making this one change by causing the base address of, of vector b to be shifted by one cache block then the performance of the program is going to be different and you could actually calculate by filling out the table once again you will find out that I will get a, a hit a, a miss on a of 0 a miss on b of 0 but I will get a hit on a of 1 a hit on b of 1 a hit on b a of 2 because of spatial locality of reference and once again I will be back at a 75 percent hit ratio which is what I could get in the case of the vector sum reduction. Therefore, this very small change in the program changed the program from one which had a 0 percent hit ratio 
to a program which had a 75 percent hit ratio and this is something under programmer control. Okay, so with this example, we have seen two examples of uh, how some understanding of cache and some understanding of how the compiler works can be used to understand the way that our pro program behaves with in connection with uh, the cache. In the lectures that follow, we will look at a few more examples. I will stop here today just reminding you that in this lecture we have seen two examples of uh, analysis of the behavior of a simple program. The programs have been very simple, just doing operations on vectors, simple loops doing operations on vectors. This allows us to do a somewhat thorough analysis of the impact of the cache on the behavior of the program. And in the second program we found that by understanding what was happening, we could quite easily find mechanisms through which we could substantially improve the behavior of the program from a 0 percent hit ratio to a 75 percent hit ratio. And we will proceed to look at uh, 4 or 5 more examples in the next lecture. Thank you.